and go to chapter 6. We've looked briefly at these chapters as we've gone through the book of 1 Timothy, and we come down to this final part of the final chapter. We introduced the last week as there's a warning, and you've seen this warning come up, of course, earlier in the book and often in the writings of the New Testament, because even as early as the first century, the devil was already at work through men to try to hinder the truth and distort the truth, and of course, he encourages uh, those that know the truth to withdraw themselves from those that would cause a problem. But then he, he characterizes at least one motive as to why, and certainly the devil uses men's hearts to be able to, to propagate false truth or false teaching rather. But if you look down in verse uh, 4, he begins to describe these teachers and he says, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, where I've come envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. So not only do they cause a problem, but they themselves are destitute of the truth. But one of the con conclusions they draw is they suppose that gain is godliness. And then, of course, he says you withdraw yourself. Now, he's going to go into a, a section here uh, on riches, on uh, the, their approach that a Christian would have. Certainly, he exhorts uh, Timothy now as he's going to be dealing with people from all different walks of life. And, and he says these teachers approach uh, what they're doing for gain. They believe that this is equated. Well, if God's blessing, well, then there's going to be money related. They, those, these people are dead and gone, but their great-great-grandchildren are still operating. Um, there's an association, of course, with the uh, televangelist and the high-profile so-called ministries and people that are very well-known. And, 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 of course, well, unfortunately, the world looks at that like that's Christianity. We understand that that's false doctrine. You know, a lie spreads much faster than the truth. And, of course, much of the motivation, now the devil's motivated differently than this, but he uses men's hearts and motivates them through gain, through money. What, what can an advantage me? You know, the devil, certainly, if he came to one of these highly gifted people and said, look, if you'll uh, go out and propagate this false truth, then we'll get all these folks to go to hell. Well, they're not motivated by that. But if he lets them think, I'm going to make you wealthy, and, of course, he doesn't talk to them, but if they, they see the, uh, the potential for gain, uh, it's far more important to them than gain than it is to be truthful. And, of course, they're destitute of truth. Now, we understand that on the negative side. But how do we view it on the positive side? What is his exhortation to the believer? Well, the first thing I note here is a calculation. Now, you look at this, there is really a, a play on words, or you could say an equation that he puts down here. For you look back in verse 5, it says, here's what the lost man thinks. Here's what the, the false teacher, he supposes that gain equals godliness. However, in verse 6, he corrects that. He says, but godliness, and with contentment is almost in parentheses, godliness equals gain. See, the lost man thinks, oh, well, to get a lot of material goods, well, that must be God's blessing. But no, what he's saying is the opposite is true. Just the blessing of God is gain. Just to have his smile, just to know that you're right with him. You know, it really is hard to explain it to a person, somebody especially that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, but if, even to approach it on an intellectual level, what is it about money that you want? I mean, you don't stuff your pillow with it. It's not comfortable. You don't lay on it. I mean, it's not something you can eat. It's just what will it do is it'll give me, well, security. Oh, it'll give me uh, toys, power. It gives me notoriety. I mean, there's many different motives that we believe money will give us. Why do you want notoriety? Maybe I like the way it feels. Why do you want toys? I just, I, I have fun with them. Why do you want a big bank account? Well, security makes me feel better. Well, all of those things can't equate what God can do to satisfy you. I mean, what if God just satisfied you? You know, money never will. We think it will, and we know biblically it won't, but there's a human aspect to think it could solve the problem. 
If money could solve the problem, then what in the world kind of shape would the government in? Because they throw money at everything. They have an unending supply. You say money doesn't grow on trees. Man, they print more than you can grow on a tree. I mean, to them, it's unending, and they cannot solve any problem. And yet Jesus has the answer to all of men's problems. See, gain is not godliness, but godliness, which of course includes contentment, is great gain. Now, godliness is more than just contentment, but really, if God instilled in you contentment, how could money compare to that? You know, here's a man, a super billionaire, and he's got, you know, maybe he's considered in Forbes magazine this particular year, I'm the richest man in the world. And then he loses $120 billion because some kind of stock goes south. Well, now he's only worth $10 billion, but he's still bothered. He's still up all night thinking, man, I've lost $100 billion. I mean, what in the, how can I do that? You know, but if you're content, it doesn't matter, does it? Contentment. Now, none of us are perfectly content. That's why we have to be exhorted to be. No, it, that's, that takes the work of the Spirit to completely make me content. Just because I'm saved, I'm not necessarily content. But godliness does come with, it brings along with it, contentment. It's part of it. Godliness. What does that mean? How do you picture godliness? Well, it means at least to be more like God. Now, we're nothing like God, are we? I mean, as a human being, what am I like God? Other than the fact that I was made in His image, and even that got knocked off course when, when man sinned against God. We're made in His image, but we're off uh, track. But you know what, how, what godliness is, is to be more like God? Well, He already lives inside of me. So the less of me and the more of Him, the more godly I am. And that brings contentment. So there's a calculation here that God gain is godliness, and obviously that's not the right calculation. Godliness brings the gain. But then I notice also now he says in verse 7, we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Now, anybody knows that, even lost people, but they don't really believe it. They don't really believe it practically, and, and yet they know it's the case, but they just can't allow that to sink down in their hearts. You brought nothing into this world. You can carry nothing out. But as has been well said, you've got to live somewhere forever. And the forever part is a whole lot longer than the little part here where you have that gain. Now, you're not earning a place in heaven by the lack of money, nor with the amount of money. You don't earn heaven, nor unearn heaven. However, when you take that perspective, you know, I started with nothing. I'm going to leave with nothing. Yes, I need some things while I'm here. I mean, let's, let's just be honest. I'm, I'm glad tonight we got a roof over our head. It cost a good bit of money to put it there. I'm glad we've got a $175,000 worth of air conditioning and heat back here. That cost a good bit of money to get put in. And that was a deal, by the way, that we had to do twice. But anyway, uh, still bitter about it. I mean, it costs money to live. You know, be kind of hypocritical to totally blast all money and then take an offering. I mean, right? Yeah, we need it to live. We're here for a while, and it comes in handy because it is. But it, our perspective is our commitment to it. Because notice what he says here in verse 8. Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. It doesn't say you can't have anything else but food and raiment. That's not the point. But if you do, then you should be content. Now, God gives us more than just food and raiment, right? God's not discussing here his blessing because he does bless us. He gives us far more than food and raiment. There's no spirituality in poverty. However, if I am in poverty and in the will of God, you can't even imagine how, but you could be content. And he in fact actually exhorts us to be. Now, if I did not have food and I did not have raiment, and I don't think, I mean, it's not just narrowed down that I got a piece of bread and I got a coat to put on. But the point is the basic necessities of life. If I have the basic necessities of life, it says be content. Now, what if I don't? You, believe it or not, sometimes godly people, God will try them, and they have less than the basic necessities. I do not have to be content when I don't have that. I go to God and say, God, I got a need. And he meets the need. God would have me sometime to be less than content in that way, 
so I'll call on him. So I'll seek him. I mean, if, if becoming a Christian just meant, look, anytime there's a need, it just happens, I would never learn to call on God. I mean, there are sometimes you've got to call on the Lord. Uh, I'm not bragging on this, or, or, or I shouldn't even use the word brag, but uh, I'm not anxious to go back to this. But in my early days of ministry, I never lacked. But there were sure times I didn't know where it was coming from. I mean, I've seen, I've been on my knees. Okay, God, you've got to meet the need. And I'll tell you this, he's never failed to meet the need in spite of me. There's been times I didn't even know where it was coming from. In fact, I thought, man, I missed a good chance to get an answer to prayer. If I knew God was going to do that, I could have prayed for it and told somebody I had an answer to prayer. But he just did it ahead of time. He knows what you have need of before you ask. In fact, I've kicked myself sometimes for trying my best to do it. And then when I gave up on all my resources, well, God, you're going to have to do it. Then he did it. And I thought, well, I should just ask him to start with. Wouldn't have had to worry over this thing nearly that much. Now, God uh, will put us through some times like that, sometimes, to learn to seek him. But he says, let us, if we start at least have basic needs, be content. Well, now God will give us other stuff, but sometimes we may not have that other stuff. So there's a, an approach for the Christian, and here's how he's going to approach it. It says in verse 9, because again, he goes back to the negative. But they that will be rich, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lust, which drown men in, in uh, destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, this is another verse uh, that's often misquoted. You know, people often say money is the root of all evil. Most time it's folks that maybe are upset that somebody else has got it and they don't. And money is the root of all evil. But if you offered them some, they'd take it. Right? It is not money that is the root of all evil. You know, God could have set this thing up. He could have set up this whole culture so that money was like a liquor bottle. It was just for the evil and just to help as a crutch and just something he didn't need that was the ill for society. He didn't. We are set up on a cost basis. It's always been like that. Not just capitalism. Anywhere you go, we can't steal. You know, and he, he even told, uh, even during the Jewish economy and the law, he did make provision for the poor, but he didn't say give it to everybody. He said just leave the corners of the field. By the way, they got to go glean it themselves and work for it. But for the most part, what were they going to do with the other part? Sell it and get gain, and that's not wrong. It's part of life. Money is the way things operate, whether it's currency, cash, whatever it is. That's, it's not that money is, is the evil, because if it wasn't for money, if we did away with so-called money, and we just came up with sort of like a, uh, a caste system, you know, if you're on this level, you can go in Walmart, and you can get this many groceries. And if you're on this level, you can actually get a boat and whatever it might be. Same thing, right? No matter what you do, there's some element of commerce that's necessary for life. Clearly, what the problem is, is two things here. One is in verse 9. It didn't say that they that are rich fall into temptation and a snare. Now, he does charge the rich in this chapter later on, gives them a very clear warning, but it does not say here that the rich fall into temptation and a snare. It says, they that will be rich. Now, do you have to be rich to will be rich? See, will re just means, look, it's kind of like wish. Now, will could mean they were successful in it too. But even if a person's not rich, but that's his goal, he can fall into temptation and a snare. On the other hand, a person could be rich, not because that was the focus, but God just chose to make them rich. Now, Job was a wealthy man. Why? I don't find anywhere in that book where he was, in fact, it's very obvious that he didn't own what he had. God owned it. Because when God took every single bit of it away from him, he said, naked came I into this world, naked shall I go. Basically what Paul says right here, I brought nothing, I can take nothing out. You say, well, he just said that because folks were looking. He didn't, nobody was around. Nobody but him and God. I mean, he didn't complain. 
it, you read, you got into the intricacies of Job's life that nobody knew about. It wasn't in front of a big old crowd. Well, bless God, he's good. No, he was by himself, every single thing taken away from him, not just financially, by the way, even his family. And he was broken, but he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. You reckon God could bless a man like that? Yeah, he could trust him. He didn't have any problem giving him that. That didn't mean that Job said one day, you know, my ambition in life, I want to have a bunch of sheep and a bunch of camels, and I'm going to build a big old fortress, and I'm going to, have a, I'm going to be the richest man in town. Because if he had, he'd have probably been here. Then that would have consumed his life. But he put God first, and it just so happened that God blessed him. Now, do, do not equate that to mean that if you put God first and you're not wealthy, that's the problem the lost man makes. But sometimes God does make people wealthy. I don't know the exact figures, but when you're a preacher, you can quote these statistics and nobody's going to check it up anyway, so you can just say it. J.C. Penney, a Christian man, started off tithing in his business. His business began to grow, and he didn't just keep giving 10%. He started giving 20%. His business continued to grow super wealthy. Man, of course, he started giving 30%. And I have read that he was giving about 90% of his income before he died and still multiply wealthy. He just tried his best to outgive God, and he couldn't do it. Now, he had the right perspective on riches. It wasn't his. He, I happened to be the steward. And boy, I believe God would just have me use this in the ministry and give it and so forth and, and give it in other ways. I mean, when you're God's steward, it's not just, okay, here's the part that's God's part. I got, what am I going to do with God's part? It's what am I going to do with 100% of what God's given me? I'm his steward. So they that will be rich. And I make that point because even here you've got saved people. He's going to charge and say, now tell the rich man, here's the problem. Be careful. It could happen. If the love of money is the root of all evil. That's a strong statement. The love of money is the root of all evil. You know, people have tried to retranslate this and, and, and try to change it a little bit, but just ask a lost man on the street, and you know what phrase they'll say? Follow the money. You want to find out where the drugs are, where the murder is, where the adultery is at, you know, whatever corruption you find, follow the money. Well, God already said that 2,000 years ago. The love of money is the root of all evil. But on the other hand, how do missionaries get on the field today? From a human standpoint, money. Now, we can love it, and it can be terrible. Used well, it can be used in the ministry, and, be, and a lot of things can be accomplished. Um, he's, telling, he's, he's saying here the attitude toward it is the problem. So that's the commitment. You're committed to the money, and it's your Lord, then you've got a problem. But on the other hand, what if I have the right attitude? Well, look secondly now. He says there's something beyond riches. What about the cause? He says in verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things, that is, the love of money, committing to uh, riches for riches' sake and so forth. Flee this and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. You know, I wonder what would happen if a believer was as well thought and uh, as good a steward, and even use a, if you want to use the term, had a business head, but their business head was to achieve a spiritual testimony. I mean, strategy, anxious, committed to it, as a lost man who loves money is committed to making money. I mean, if we were that committed to godliness, the thing is, I've got a banker, spiritually, a lot bigger than the financial man's banker. I've got a spiritual bank uh, of unlimited inheritance that I can draw from when I follow after these things. I mean, Jesus basically said this in Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he didn't just say in that, you seek his righteousness and that's all you need. He said, and all these things shall be added unto you. Sure, God will uh, follow you up with the food you need to eat and take care of you in menial ways. We have physical needs that need to be met. But he said, here's what you follow after. Here's what you put first. Why do you think that he had to tell Timothy? I mean, Timothy's a man of God. He says right here, verse 11, But thou, O man of God, 
flee these things and follow after. You think Tom, Timothy um, had already taken persecution for his faith. Timothy is obviously a, a, a understudy of Paul. He is a man of God. I mean, I feel like he's a person who could be looked up to spiritually. And Paul had to remind him to flee after these things. It doesn't just happen. We need to be confronted by the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God every day. And just like Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow him. He said, Timothy, don't forget. You're going to have bills to pay. You're going to have things that are going to take up your time. You're going to have the affairs of life. You're going to have to make some money. You're going to have to make sure. I mean, what kind of testimony would be if Timothy was out begging with a pot? How would that look? No. He said, you're, going to be, you're not going to be lazy. I mean, you think you wouldn't have a bunch of lazy Christians if all we had to do was pray and God would send a, mail, a, a check to our mailbox. Oh, well, I don't bother working. I mean, i got other things I could be doing, and it wouldn't be spiritual. It'd just be, so, oh, yeah, God will send me a check. No, God wants us to work and prove it, but there are some times when we can't do it. God will provide it. But what we can do is say, God, I can focus on these things, on walking with God, and seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's really just a matter of stewardship. He, of course, says in verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Now he says, not only do you have a pursuit, which is the godliness, there's a person. And then, of course, as Paul is not unlike to do, he brags on the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I charge, I, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot and unrebukable unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what we're doing here is we're, we're yeah, you, you follow after these things. And he said, Timothy, here's what's at stake. There's a cause. There is a cause that is greater than any financial obligation that these men might follow after, these lost men. Now, what's their cause? Success, right? What man calls success. I mean, it's pretty important to be a big shot. Again, are you, you know, respected? Uh, you have your name, you know, out there or whatever, you're considered to be successful. The Christian says, man, I got a cause as well. My cause is Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my cause. Now, uh, he, he mentions here that we do this unto the appearing of Jesus Christ in verse 15 says, which in his times he shall show. You know, really it's not his time. When he left this earth, he told his captors, this is your hour and the power of darkness. Um, you, you, you know how you could put God to death? He says, because I'm letting you. This is your hour. This is the uh, hour right now. The devil has some, some reign. Now, he's losing. The gates of hell are not going to prevail against the church, but he's got reign. But what about when his time comes? When he shows himself, you know, Jesus is not going to come and just put a foot in the water, as it were, and test the waters. When he comes, that's it. I mean, when he comes, the devil is going to be bound. He's sitting on the throne. I don't want to use biblical language. I was going to say all bets are off, but I don't want to say that. We're talking about that. But I mean, this, the, 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 the gauntlet is thrown down. I mean, when his time comes, we know what's going to happen. Because what it says is, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hey, when the king sits on the throne, then all things come into perspective. He says, Timothy, just hang on. Keep him first because we have a cause. You know, we follow the Lord of lords and the King of kings. The blessed and only potentate. The world's had their so-called potentates, right? God says they, we really hadn't had any. They just think they are. There's only one ultimately in charge. Even the kings, God says his, his heart's in the Lord's hand. So they're, really, they think they're in charge. They're really not in charge. You know, it's comforting to me to know Joe Biden's not in charge. I'm comforted that he's not in charge. 
that God's in charge. Now, I can't say I'm not a little nervous when I know he's in charge of the Army and Navy and Marine, you know, Commander-in-Chief, but I'm really not because God's in charge. He is the only potentate. And you could say that if anybody else is in there as well. I mean, God is in control. Um, he goes on in verse 16 to describe who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, who no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now, I'm not going to take a lot of time, but go back and study this time, or sometime when you can, because he, he makes a, a point in verse 13, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things before Christ Jesus. Somebody would say, oh, well, okay, there's God. And then obviously Christ Jesus is a different person. Well, we know we're, he's speaking of his earthly uh, ministry here. He's saying before Pontius Pilate, the man Christ Jesus, oh, well, aren't they two different people? But then go over to verse 16, still talking about Jesus, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, who no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power and everlasting. You can't say that about anybody but God. He's the only one who has honor and power everlasting. Well, you say, I've never seen Jesus. You've seen Christ Jesus, but the Son of God, no man has seen any time. He's been declared by our Lord Jesus Christ. God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Ghost is one. So he's speaking here about the deity of Christ even in this passage. Now, we're almost out of time, but notice this last charge here. He talks uh, about the charge. He says, charge them that are rich in this world. Now, he's not talking about unbelievers now. And he's not, the word charge means, hey, here's, a, here's something you need to watch out for. Here's a charge for you. Um, he charged Timothy. He's saying, charge those that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. Isn't that a temptation? I mean, um, if a person was really good at preaching, let's say like their brother Haynes here, and he's really, you know, a good, good preacher, he would have a temptation to think, I bet a lot of people think I'm pretty good. But he could be high-minded, right? But it wouldn't be wrong for him to be a good preacher. God gave him the ability. And so, but if he, I could charge another preacher. I could charge, in fact, I've been charged as a student at, at seminary and so forth, uh, you know, be careful that when people come out and brag on your preaching, let it go in one ear and out the other. You don't be high-minded. Make sure you understand who's doing this. You've got a powerful book. People are going to be affected by it. You better remember who it is. That, okay, a rich man could be the same way, right? I've got every good intention. But people start telling me how good I am and how important I am and how much they're in prayer. You know, people will butter up to people with money, won't they? Oh, absolutely. Oh, that doesn't happen in churches, though, right? No. He's saying, don't be high-minded, uh, nor trust in certain riches. Couldn't a rich man have that temptation? There is a downside to being wealthy. Even as a Christian, I could be high-minded. I could trust in it. Man, I've always had plenty of money, and I can't worry about anything because, I mean, after all, I buy myself out of it. You better be careful. Even if you did, you're still not right with God because you trust in riches. So he's saying, be careful of this. But trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Well, that tells me right there he gave the rich man what he had. He says that they do good. And here's what a Christian rich man does. That they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Distribute and communicate means give it to others when the need exists. Now, if a rich man was a Christian and says, well, God told me to be willing to communicate, I'm going to go out here and get all these folks that are begging for money and pay their light bill and all, well, he'd never quit. He, nobody's got that much money. I mean, that's not the idea. The idea is being ready to meet a need when the need is there. What A rich man is just like a poor man. He's just got stewardship over a bigger amount. I'm just God's steward. God owns it. He tells me where to go, you know, what to do with it and so forth. He says, just charge the rich that they be willing to have good works, be a great testimony, willing to distribute. Because frankly, it is a testimony to lost rich men when Christian rich men handle money in a godly manner. It, you know, they look, maybe perhaps look at a, a poor, oh, they wouldn't know what it's like. They have no idea what it would be like this to have control over this kind of money. But then here's a J.C. Penney who does. That's a testimony, rich in good works. 
laying up in store, because here's the issue, they're investing. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now, do not equate that with earning eternal life. Equating, they lay hold on it. They get benefit from it. They already have it. They already have the eternal life. Now they're actually benefiting from the life that Jesus has instilled in them. Why? Because they've lined up with the will of God. So they can serve God just as much. Now again, he just got off this subject. So he charges them with their particular temptation. We all have our struggles. We all have our need. uh, But they have this particular warning that he gives to them. So he ends the book like this, Old Timothy Keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. So if I wasn't out of time, we'd probably ran on that for a few minutes. Which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Yeah, they still do. Grace be with thee. Amen. And that's how he ends this chapter. We're going to end there as well as we're out of time. Lord, we're thankful tonight for the opportunity to study your word. We're thankful for the blessing of God. Lord, you've reminded us in the Bible that the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and it bringeth no sorrow with it. Lord, we know that you do bless, you do take care of us, and we're thankful. Lord, we enjoy uh, much of what we do as far as overflow, but help us to always seek first the kingdom of God, to put you first, and to put the cause of Christ in front of everything else. Give us that heart tonight, give us power to do it, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.